glad to be here with you this morning. If you haven't met me yet, my name is Amy, and I am one of the pastors here. And it's my job to continue this reset series and follow up from what God has been doing from those 21 days of prayer. I mean, that was, to me, one of my favorite things about our church is that we are willing to take a, a deeper look at ourselves and a deeper um, commitment to God twice a year for these 21 days of prayer and bring up the spiritual temperature in our lives, right? And to really get on our knees and be really intentional and deliberate to pray for the lost people in our lives, to pray for each other, to pray for whatever it is that God and us are working on. And so I just love our 21 days of prayer. And I was telling our staff this morning, I don't really know exactly what's going to come of it, but I know God's going to use that. And there will be things that will be tied to that season of prayer um, that God's going to do. And I just, I can't wait to see what's going to be. I'm excited about a couple of things that I want to share with you this morning. The first one is our women's conference. The registration is now open as of today. So if you are um, a woman, I want you to sign up. You don't want to miss this. And then I want you to share it with your other friends and invite them to come along and be part of it as well. So the first 75 people that sign up get a free tote bag. I know all the guys are like, why do you guys do that kind of stuff? I don't know. We like that kind of stuff. We like to have a race and then get something free. And so first 75 to sign up. Um, so I would encourage you to sign up. You can, um, you can find that on social media as well. And then we're really excited about trying something new this year to have all of our life groups gather together. If you're in a life group, you'll come here on the evening of September 22nd and 29th. You'll come here. If you're not in a life group, but you want to try a life group, you'll come here and we'll put you in a group and it will be for six weeks. So you don't have to like, you know, sign anything in blood. You don't have to be with them forever and ever. If you love your group, you can continue. If you're like, this isn't really quite the right fit for me, you don't have to, okay? And so it's a six-week trial, but we really believe that we find freedom in groups and in talking and discussing God's word. And so we're excited about that on those evenings. So there's no sign up, you just show up, all right? And so we're, we're happy about that. This, this morning, we're going to talk about resetting our perspective. We're starting at the same starting point. We've been in Isaiah 43, 19, and so I'm going to start us right here. It says, for I am about to do something new. See, I've already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness, and I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. We've talked about this passage each Sunday in this reset series, and most of the time we're talking about how when you get something new, it's exciting, and it's good, and I think that's true for the most part. I think we notice and we talk about new shoes. If you get new shoes, somebody's like, hey, are your shoes new? I'd like them. And then we tell them how much we got them or how much their price was or where we got them, you know, because we're excited. And if we see a kid in new shoes, we'll say, hey, did you get new shoes? And then we always ask them the same second question. Are they fast? You know, um, because we're happy for people to get new shoes. And new shoes are a fun thing we want people to notice. I think we, um, we do the same thing when it comes to, like, um, a new car. If you get a new car, even if it's a new car to you, but it's not even brand new, we still are happy for each other. We're like, you got a new car? That's awesome. Good for you. But I do think there are certain things that when we get something new, we're not quite as excited about it. For example, I've never really heard anybody say, you got a new boss? That's awesome. That's great. Most of the time when you get a new boss, somebody's like, oh, new boss? How's that working out for you? Right? And the same thing is true if you get a new neighbor who moves in next to you. People tend to assume not positive. They tend to assume, like, you go to your neighbor, are they weird? <laughs> you going to be all right? Are they weird? You know? We're, comp- we're, we're immediately checking in on each other when it's new. Kids go to a new school year, a new teacher. We're like, you like her? Is she a good teacher? What do you think of her? You know? So I think sometimes when we have something new, um, it kind of makes us feel like we've lost our sense of control. We've lost our sense of what's normal to us. And so I think there are certain things that, when they're new, they intimidate us. And um, they make us a little skeptical or a little hesitant. And I think that is true with what we're going to talk about today. Today we're talking about resetting your perspective, and we're going to talk about spiritual gifts. And I think there's a lot of us in the room that on this topic we just kind of tune out because we're not even sure what in the world is going on, what do they mean by spiritual gifts, who has them, what's that mean, and so a lot of times we kind of assume the worst, or we take a little bit of a hesitant kind of step back, that's weird, that's weird, 
um, and we don't know what to do about it. And so I'm hoping that today we can drop our uneasiness and drop our um, skepticism or our, our worriedness, and we can pick up our spiritual gifts um, with some fervor and with some excitement. So that's kind of the goal today. This, mo- or this week, uh, one of our high school communicators was talking at one of our 21 days of prayer devotional, and um, man, our, can I, just for a second, can we talk about how our young communicators did an amazing job? Wow. Wow. Uh, But I wrote this down from um, something that she said. And she said that God speaks to who we are before he tells us what to do. I don't know if that's exactly how she said it, but that's how I put it in my notes. God speaks to who we are before he tells us what to do. So I think oftentimes when it comes to spiritual gifts, we step into this relationship with God and we feel good, really good about the newness of forgiveness We're like, he tells you you're forgiven, and we're like, oh, thank you. He tells you I've got mercy for you, oh, thank you. He tells you, you know, I'm going to do a new thing in you, and it feels great. That feels awesome. And then we just don't really even talk about this whole spiritual gift thing that comes with um, becoming a follower of Christ, because I don't think we know quite what to do with it. And so I hope after today we got a little bit more Uh, understanding. And I'm going to start us in um, one of the um, key passages in the New Testament that talks about spiritual gifts from some verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, dear brothers and sisters, regarding your question about the special abilities the Spirit gives us, I don't want you to misunderstand this. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. Okay, time out. That sentence is really important. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another. And to someone else, the one spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles. hey And another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the spirit of God or from another spirit. Still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It is the one and only spirit who distributes these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. I know when you read this, you tend to get a little bit worked up because there were big words in there like performing miracles and prophesying and things like that. And so just hang tight with me for a minute and I want you to catch the basis of what this passage was teaching us first, okay? The first thing I want us to see is that spiritual gifts are from God. So that means it's not the same as your life experiences that have given you an extra talent in something, It's not the same as like any trainings. It kind of helps you um, communicate better or that's not the same thing. It's not the same thing as your personality, although that was given to you by God and a mixture of your life experiences is twined in there. But I mean, um, it's, it's not the same thing. A spiritual gift is a gift from God. And then we also saw in there, not only is it a gift from God, they're given to every believer, to each one of us, it said. A spiritual gift is given to each one of us. Now, I know already you're looking at me saying, yeah, okay, makes sense that you pastors have a spiritual gift. I just don't think I've got one. I don't think it's very important. I don't, I don't think that's for me. Um, but that passage said that it was given to every believer. And the reason? So that we can help each other. So every, a spiritual gift is, is from God. It's given to every believer. And the whole point of it is so that we can help each other. They're meant to build up the body of Christ. What that means is your spiritual gift isn't something that you need to be, that you should be unaware of or not using. It's not something to put away on a shelf and just pull it out on Sunday mornings and then put it back for the rest of the week. Your spiritual gift is not something that um, is to be ignored. But I think we look at that, that list that I read and we have people that are falling into two camps. I think some of you read that list and you're so excited. You're like, oh my word, God gives all those gifts and those all sound so exciting. And you're like the first one in line and you're telling God, give me as many as you want. Give me all the spiritual gifts. This is awesome. And then I think there's some other people and, and you hear about the spiritual gifts 
and you're standing there and you're kind of like this with God. Then go first. They seem pretty excited. And you're backing away. You're backing away from this whole conversation because it's a little bit new and new feels scary and it's a little bit uncomfortable. So let's look at this other passage that talks about spiritual gifts and let's keep kind of getting some understanding underneath us. This is in Romans chapter 12. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take that responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Amen. This feels a little more practical, right? Still had a big word in there. Had the word in there, prophesy. And I just want to say for just a minute, when we see that word, a lot of times we immediately think Old Testament prophets, like somebody who's been given a specific word to say, to warn some people that something is coming. Really, another way to look at the gift of prophecy is to speak with faith. So earlier, I didn't really mean to do this today, but it just happened. I kind of prophesied and spoke with faith by saying, that 21 days of prayer season, God's going to do something with it. I am believing in faith that God's going to do something with that season of prayer that you prayed, that I prayed, that we collectively as a body spent time and, and were intentional, more intentional with him. That's really just speaking out in faith, okay? Um, I don't know what he's going to do. He didn't tell me. I don't have the specifics, but I am confident and I'm speaking out in faith that I know God doesn't waste that kind of thing, and that is a, a beautiful gift that we gave him, and he's going to do something with it. Amen. And so I don't want you to freak out when you see those words, but I also want you to realize that when it says if you're teaching, teach well, you know, um, if you're giving, give generously, some of those things, as we're learning about spiritual gifts, um, I want you to know that what it does not mean. It does not mean that if you teach Algebra 2, first of all, God love you. God love you. I cried through Algebra 2. I cried through it as a high schooler, and now my daughter's in it. I'm probably going to cry again, um, and she probably will too. But Algebra 2, if you teach Algebra 2, what this is not, not saying is God gave you a spiritual gift, and you're going to teach Algebra 2 even better. What that means is if you are a teacher, and then God's saying if he gives you the spiritual gift of teaching on top of that, Ooh, you got some training in teaching, and he's going to put you to use to be able to explain the word of God, to build other people up. But not everybody that has the, the, uh, the spiritual gift of teaching has to be a teacher. Are you tracking with me? It just means that if you are a teacher and you've gotten the extra spiritual gift, God might amplify it and put it to spiritual use. But it also does not mean I have to have that training because God just gives me a gift. So some of you have the ability, the spiritual gift of teaching, and what that means is when somebody asks you a spiritual question, man, you really, uh, you get excited. You get excited to talk to them about what you know about that. And if you don't know, you do what every good teacher does. You go find the answer, and then you come back and tell them the answer because you can't quit thinking about it because you love how curious they are, and you love that they're hungry for the word, and you want to give them something back. That's the spiritual gift of teaching in a way that makes um, a, a spiritual impact, all right? So spiritual gifts, we, we recognize that um, the word says they're given to every believer and they're for the good of all people to build up each other up, right? And they came from God. We said that in both those passages. So River Church, I got to ask you, do you think that this word is true and accurate? Okay, that was what some of you do. Do we think that this word is the truth? Yes. All right, get ready for it then. Get ready for it. Because then that means that the word just told you, I have a spiritual gift from God. If it's given to every believer, then that means you have a spiritual gift from God. So now for class participation, we're all going to say it together. We need to hear it in our own voices. On the count of three, read it with me. One, two, three. I have a spiritual gift from God. And just because I think you need to do it again, turn to your neighbor and say, I have a spiritual gift from God. 
You do. You are not the exception. You didn't get skipped over. You may not be aware of it. You may not know what it is yet. You may not be using it. But you have been given a spiritual gift from God. And the second thing that we learn in both of those passages is that the world would be better if I used my spiritual gift. Say it with me, class. One, two, three. The world would be better if I used my spiritual gift. If we believe it to be true, then both of those things are true. You have a spiritual gift, and the world would be a better place if you'd figure out how to use it. It would just make an impact if you knew how to use your spiritual gift. All right, we've got to reset our perspective because I think we're afraid. I think there's a, we have all the excuses in the world why we think we're the exception or we think ours is not that important, so we're going to work through the common things that I think we're afraid of, all right? I think we need to overcome the fear of others' opinions. I think the first place we got to start, if we're really going to start using our spiritual gifts, I think we have, to, we have to overcome the fear of other people's opinions. Paul was writing to Timothy, and he said this in chapter, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. We got to get over what we think other people think about us, right? Half the time, people aren't thinking about us as much as we think they're thinking about us, right? We have got to get over the fear of what other people might think about us being used for God. Some of us think, well, I haven't, been, I haven't been a Christian long enough. Well, I don't know the Bible good enough. Well, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. We've got all these reasons why we think we are not the one that needs to be using a spiritual gift. But according to this, even if you're young in your faith, even if you're young in chronological age, it doesn't matter. Don't neglect your gift. You've been given a gift. Don't neglect it. The second thing I think is we need to overcome the fear of failure. We've got to overcome the fear of failure. I think we're afraid to step out and try something because we're afraid it won't work out. Well, just like anything, our spiritual gifts get better when we're using them, like with practice. And we figure out with more time how God has actually wired us and gifted us and how that can be put to good use. So yes, maybe when you first start, it won't be quite as, as well accomplished as it will be later when you're using your spiritual gifts. But we got to start somewhere. And I, the passage that I think sticks out to me about this is in Hebrews chapter 13. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may you work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our God is a God of peace. This is not a bad surprise. There's no like gotcha in it. There's not like this gift that he's going to give you and then pull the rug out from underneath you. This is a good thing. He's a God of peace. There's nothing to be afraid of. I think that um, one of the things that's really interesting to me is uh, how when kids are young, we have all these like educational toys, right? Right? When they're young, we have like the Velcro books and, and lift up the flap and see what this animal's doing, right? We have the little puzzles, the peg puzzles where you're putting things in. We have little basketball hoops. You have little whatever, all the different toys. This one, I, it kind of confuses me. I'm not really sure why for decades and decades we've mass produced the Jack in the Box. I have no idea why we have decided that a part of a kid's developmental stages should be a brightly colored box with a pleasant little song that they can play with their little motor skills that don't work super great, so it probably takes them a lot longer than this to get this thing turning. And just when they're having a great time, this, the, the creepy little clown freaks, freaks them out. I don't understand why we have decided that we want to teach little kids to be scared of the next toy we hand them and the next toy for a while. That makes no sense to me. This is not how God operates. There is no gotcha moment. The, the gift that he is giving you is a good gift and it's equipping you and it should bring you peace. It should bring you peace. Not only should it bring you peace, 
but it should bring you a sense of um, confidence. Because if God's equipping me, then I'm competent for whatever it is he's sending me out to do. If he's the one equipping me. So our spiritual gifts, they bring calmness, they bring confidence, and they bring competence from God. We don't have anything to be scared of. He's a good God, and he gives us good gifts. However, I still think we have to overcome the fear of insignificance. I think what's another way that the enemy jumps in our path from us being able to reach more people for Christ and build up the body of Christ with our spiritual gifts, I think the other way he does it is he's constantly telling us, you're not, you don't have that gift. That one seems pretty important, and you don't have that one. So your gift's not very important. So don't use it. Put it away. It's insignificant. Because if you don't have that gift, that's the real difference maker. So if you don't have that one, you don't really have a, a good one or a big one. Nobody's, nothing to worry about. And so here's a Paul writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He says the human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not a hand, that doesn't make it any less part of the body. And if the ear says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? And if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it had only one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can never say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. Amen. It doesn't really matter what your part is, because what you perceive to be less important might actually be one of the most necessary spiritual gifts. Um, and so your concern might be that your gift is insignificant. And it is time for us, River Church, to reset our perspective on all of this. We're going to reset our perspective that your gift is there on purpose. Your gift was given to you for this season of life in your setting, knowing your workplace, your neighbors, your family, your age, your everything. Your gift is there on purpose. And uh, we have to figure out how to find our spiritual gifts and, and how we can do that. Because we, because we have to recognize that our gift is important. Some of the ones we think are the, are the weakest might be the most necessary. So here we go. Here's your assignment. This QR code will take you to a spiritual gifts inventory. I happen to know that there's no Olympics on today and football hasn't started. So I'm going to give you a classroom assignment. This will take about 20 minutes for you to fill, to fill out this form and figure out what your spiritual gifts are. So grab your phone and pull it up and get yourself ready for that. It's also on your next steps tab on your app and on the website, and you can get to it that way as well. But if I know if you pull it open and do it right now, it'll still be on your phone when you leave here, and it'll remind you to do it. We can no longer just live unaware of how God has gifted us. The world is in a mess, and we have the answers. And God has gifted us in certain ways to be used. And we've got to figure out how it is that he's gifted us to be used. Another place you can find this out is if you take growth track. We're, we're currently in the process of um, revising and revamping growth track, and the new version will be out in October. Um, but growth track is a three-week class, and in the middle of that, you take your spiritual gifts test, and then we talk about what's, what are some different ways you can use your spiritual gifts. Um, and so that's another place you can do that. But I don't want you to wait till growth track. I want you to do it today. I want you to go home spiritually curious, and I want you to be Open the gift that God has given you and be willing to do that. Uh, knowing your spiritual gift will give you the confidence to live it out. Because like we said, your spiritual gift is there on purpose. It's important. But your spiritual gift is only as useful as the amount that you use it. 
It's only as useful as the amount that you're using it. I took the, I took the um, spiritual gifts test this week just as a refresher, see what it would tell me. And mine were administration, encouragement, and teaching. All right? Nothing to be scared of in there, people. All right? So those were the top three that I scored. And you might look at me and be like, no, yeah, that makes sense. And if you would tell me what yours are, I might look at you and say the same thing. Like, yeah, that makes sense. But knowing that empowers me. Knowing that kind of is, a, is almost ascending. It tells me what to do and to get going and doing it. Um, and so it's really important that we know our spiritual gifts and that we actually use them. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus told the parable of the talents. Now, a talent at the time was, it was a term for money. But I also just want to use it as we're talking about talents, like special gifts and abilities. When Jesus told this story about the talents, he talked about how everybody had different talents. And he praised and celebrated the people who took their talents, went away, and used them because they multiplied. And when they came back, he was like, good job. You were supposed to put that to use. But there was one person who took that talent and dug a hole and buried it in the ground because he was scared to lose it. He was scared to use it. And he got scolded by Jesus to say, it's not meant to be hidden away and buried. It's meant to be used. Because when you use it, I'll do this multiplication with it. And so your spiritual gift is really only as useful as the amount that you use it. And it's only as effective as you use it. When I was studying this week, um, I found something completely new. Um, I love when I'm reading God's word and I'm reading a familiar passage and then something new just pops off of the page. And I'm like, oh! I, didn't ever, I did not ever put two and two together. So I'm going to share with you what happened. When I was looking at these passages, um, the 1 Corinthians 12 and the Romans 12 passages, I read a little bit what was before and what was a little bit after in the verses that I was going to use, and I found a common theme. Let me show it to you. In 1 Corinthians 12, this is the part about the eye and the hand, and they can't say to each other, I don't need you. This is the, verse, the three verses right after that. And now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but I have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and I give over my body to hardship that I might boast but I have not love, I gain nothing. And I'm like, oh, you know, we, we break that apart as a different chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is the love chapter. You read it in weddings. It doesn't go with spiritual gifts, except that it does. It's a continued conversation. And the same thing's true in Romans chapter 12. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. And one more passage where I found spiritual gifts and sincere love tied together. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. I just had this aha moment where I was recognizing that whenever God talks about, or the, whenever the New Testament talks about spiritual gifts, it says, but you have to sincerely love people. And then it talks about spiritual gifts, and then it says, but hey, you need to sincerely love people. And then it talks about it again, it says, use your gift, but you have to sincerely love people. What that means is I'm not just checking it off the list. I'm not just, I'm not just um, using my gift and, uh, and, and checking it off like, okay, I, I did what I was supposed to do. It means my motive matters. It means that my heart needs to sincerely love God and sincerely love others. I think our spiritual gifts, this is just an Amy Beagle idea, just to take it or leave it. I think our spiritual gifts are activated by sincere love. I think that that's when the power happens, when you can sincerely love God and love others, and then you use his gift. Wow. Now watch what he's going to do in you and through you. I think that um, oftentimes we're, we're quick to compare. We're quick to, we're quick to recognize, you know, what somebody else has, like I talked about before. 
Like, for example, I think Bailey's gift of encouragement through worship is something I am coveting, right? I'm like, she can play the piano, she can play the guitar, she can sing, and when she does that, it makes me think of God. It makes me turn my eyes toward him. It makes me worship, right? But that is not the gift God gave me. I want it. I tried to have it. I think my mom wanted me to have it. She sent me to piano lessons for four years, and I begged and cried to quit. And at the end of the four years, the nice little old lady said, she's not any better. Let her quit. <laughs> and so I quit. But man, I think my mom and I both wanted me to have this gift so that I can encourage and, and, and point you to Jesus because of my beautiful singing voice. Well, if I sang for you right now, probably nobody would get closer to Jesus, um, unless you're just asking him to make it stop. Um, but I have other gifts, and so do you. It's so do you. And when we don't use them, if we said that the world's a better place if we use our spiritual gifts, then the opposite of that is true as well. The world suffers from us not using our spiritual gifts. The world's a darker place because we're not using our spiritual gifts. The enemy has sold us a whole bunch of lies. He's told us your gift is not important. He's told you you don't need to know it. He's told you that's weird stuff. Stay away from that. Back away. I think, church, it is time for us to get off the spiritual couch, so to speak, and to stop being spiritually lazy because God has given you something to do. And I think it's going to be really fulfilling when you step into using his gift. I also think it's time that we unbury the talents that are in the backyard, that we actually take the 20 minutes today and be curious with God. God, what is it that you gave to me? What's the good gift or gifts that you gave to me? I want them. I want to know what they are. And so I'll spend this time trying to assess and see what it is you gave me because I'm going to unbury them. They're no longer staying in my backyard buried for safekeeping. I'm going to dig them out, and I'm going to use the talents that you gave me. God has given something to you. He's preloaded your toolbox with the equipment that you need to be able to reach the lost and to build up other Christians. That's how he's wired you. Tim Keller said, God does not give us exactly what we ask for. And said he gives us what we would have asked for had we known everything he knows. I think that's important for us. We, we come to this church, I think most of us come to this church because we have a shared mission and vision. We want people to know God. We want people to find freedom. We want people to discover their purpose. And if that's the stage you're in, in it's time to get going. Because you can then make a difference. And we want that for other people. We've got to want it for ourselves, enough to do just a little digging and figure out how God has wired us and what he has given us. It's going to, the world can be a better place. The world doesn't have to be as dark. If we're all out there, he's given us the gift of, of participation. He allows us to be part of the ministry. And then he gives us what we need in the toolbox and says, you got this. You got this. I'm a God of peace. I'm equipping you to do everything I'm asking you to do. Here's your toolbox. You got this. Now, some of you are here, and all of this is like brand new. Never heard it. I'm asking you to not be scared of it and just to try and see what it is God has for you. Try to go to growth track. Try to fill out the spiritual gifts test. Go back and read these passages. Pray on it. Ask God to show you how he's made you, what he's gifted you with. Some of you also, you need to take the first gift. Some of you are here today and you haven't received a spiritual gift yet because you need to first receive Christ as your Savior. And the best gift he has given all of us is the gift of forgiveness. He doesn't hold anything over our heads. The gift of unconditional love like we won't ever experience from any human. He gives us forgiveness. He gives us love. He accepts us into his family. And some of you need to start there. So I'm just going to ask you all, River Church, to just bow your heads. I'm going to ask you to just think about where you're at. Where are you in all of those options? If you're the person who, who needs to get off the, the spiritual couch, do a little business with God. 
and ask him to show you more of your giftings. Ask him to build your confidence. If you're the person who, uh, who needs to make that first decision and you're ready to do it today, then with your head bowed, I'm just going to pray. And I just want you to pray along. Lord, I realize you're not a God of rules. You're a God who gives gifts. And today I want to receive the gift of your forgiveness. I confess that I have made mistakes. I have messed up. I have sinned. And I want you to come into my life and start a brand new thing in me. I'm asking you to give me the gift of forgiveness and unconditional love. I'm asking for your grace and your mercy to pour over me and give me the faith to believe it. After I leave this place, give me the faith to believe it. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you put us to work. We thank you that you equip us. You don't just kind of push us out the door and say good luck, but you've given us a toolbox. And Lord, this world is waiting on us. So Lord, would you put us to work? Help us to, to overcome our fears. Help us to, to get moving spiritually, Lord, in the next stage of our life with you. We love you, God. It's in your name we pray. Amen.